Section 7.1 begins chapter seven, which is applications of integration. And 7.1 is specifically areas between curves. So if we want to calculate the area between a curve uh, f of x and between a curve g of x and along an interval from a to b, if it turns out that f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, as we have in the beige box here, then the area between those two curves is given by this integral formula. Um, the integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x with respect to x. So a picture of what's going on here is pretty straightforward, but f of x is a larger function than g of x. And uh, we're not necessarily assuming they're positive, um, but we have drawn it that way. It's just easier to see it in the first quadrant here. And we're going from a to b along the x-axis. So the area that's between these two curves is really given by, we can approximate it via rectangles um, drawn between each of these two curves. I've used midpoints for these rectangles to connect. When we take the limit as n goes to infinity, that won't really matter. So the height of each one of these rectangles is actually f of x at that um, x value, we'll call it xi, or in this case, it could be x1, divided by g of x1 or g of xi in general for our general rectangles. Okay, so that would approximate the area between these two curves. And if we take infinitely many rectangles, or let n go to infinity for all these rectangles, and sum them all up, we'll get the, the, uh, the integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x dx. So remember, I guess along the way, we skipped a couple steps, but the area of the ith rectangle, say this one right here, is the height of the rectangle, which we've already discussed, times the width of the rectangle, delta x. Okay, now if we sum up every one of these ith um, areas, so a sub i for one to, to n for our n rectangles, then we get an approximation. That's the sum of all these rectangles that we see here added together, and that's approximating the area between the curves. But if we take the limit as n goes to infinity, that's what this arrow is indicating as n goes to infinity. Then we arrive at the definite integral from a to b, f of x minus g of x dx. So there we've defined our, um, our area between two curves through this formula right here. So let's have a look at using it. It's not, it's not too difficult. We just usually have to identify um, intersection points and uh, which curve is larger than the other and where that might actually change. So, um, it's, it's usually good to fully determine the region for which the area must be found. In other words, if they intersect in certain ways um, where the region begins and ends with the boundaries of such a region might be. Sketching it is always advised, right? It's probably a good idea to draw it or have a, a graphing utility graph it for you so you can work from there. Um, find all the intersection points of the curves because we might have they might change heights. One might change and be larger than the other one. Um, as we evaluate these things. So decide whether to integrate over the x-axis or the y-axis. Uh, so that's just a matter of what's more convenient. Okay, some problems are much easier to integrate over the y-axis than they are instead of over the x-axis. So in other words, using a dx versus a dy in the integral. So using a dy would be integrating over the y-axis. Determine which curve has greater y values over the region or x values over the region. And uh, you might have to test to do that to, to know which curve is larger than the other. And then we subtract the lesser curve from the greater curve along each region for which that's the case. And then we calculate that integral. So that's a general guideline. Maybe not all those steps are appropriate for every problem every time, but um, in general, uh, no more steps than that are usually required. So we're asked to find the area between the region formed by y equals one over x, y equals one over x squared, and x equals two. So this is one where we don't quite have a fully determined region until we have a look at it. And we realize that one over x and one over x squared are similarly shaped curves. They do this sort of behavior, this uh, inverse curve sort of behavior in the first quadrant and also the second quadrant, but We'll, we'll realize that if we set y1, the first function, equal to the second, second via this equation right here, then we have one over x equals one over x squared by what y1 and y2 are. In other words, we set each of our two functions equal to each other via the variable y. 
So one over x equals one over x squared. We multiply both sides by x squared and we end up with, or we just invert both sides and we end up with x equals x squared, uh, taking the reciprocal on each side. So collecting terms on one side, x squared minus x equals zero. Factoring out an x, we have x times x minus one equals zero. And we have two candidates for intersection points. That's x equals zero and x equals one. But don't be in too much of a hurry to go plotting x equals zero, because we realize that x equals zero is not in the domain of either of these functions. So we have to throw that one out. x equals one is in the domain. There's no problem dividing by one, so that's fine. So we have our intersection point of these two curves it's right here at one comma one. So you plug in one, one to this function, you get one. Plug in one to this function, you get one. So that is indeed an intersection point for these. There's only one in this one. And our, the rest of our region is x equals two. That's a vertical line with x value two. So now our region is this weird little wedge crescent kind of thing. And we have to remember which, which function is larger than the other one from, uh, from this far forward, from this point forward on the x-axis. In other words, for x values that are greater than one, it's reasonable to check x equals two. What happens when we plug in x equals two to this function? We get one half. When we plug in x equals two to this function, we get one fourth. So it looks like one over x is gr greater than one over x squared when x equals two. So because that's one half for one over x and one fourth for one over x squared. So however we determine that, we know that y equals one over x is the upper function. They only have this single intersection point. So we know they don't intersect again down here somewhere and cross each other. In particular, we know they're not going to intersect in here, and that's what matters. So x equals 2 is our other border. And that stops us here. So we'll integrate from 1 to 2, since that's where the region begins on the x-axis and ends on the y-axis. And we'll subtract 1 over x squared from 1 over x. And I've written those as x to the negative 1 and x to the negative 2 over here, integrating from 1 to 2. Um, a good indication, especially when there's only one intersection point like this, that maybe something's gone wrong, is if our answer is not positive when we're done. We should find the positive area. Um, if that's the case, maybe you get lucky and you just change the sign, and uh, maybe you did find the, the correct positive area of things um, for a quick hack. Now, um, integrating each of these, uh, antiderivative of x to the negative 1 is natural log of x. The antiderivative of negative x to the negative 2 is this. Evaluate both of these at their limits of integration. So at this point minus at this point. So we have at two minus at one. With a function of two minus the function of one. And when we combine all of these, we find that we have the natural log of two minus one half. So I guess we don't know right away whether or not that's positive or negative. If we think about it, um, E is the base of natural logarithm. It's approximately 2.71. Um, it looks like you know, e to what power is equal to two. That's how we think through this logarithm. That's pretty close to one. e to the power of one is a little bit larger than two. So maybe it's e to the 0.75 is equal to two. At any rate, uh, if you plug this into a calculator, you'll find that it is greater than zero. And that's just a decent check to say that, well, we don't see anything wrong with our answer yet. So there it is, we determined our region. We determined uh, intersection points, which function was larger than the other. We set up our integral and went from there. So let's see another one. Find the area of the region formed by these two curves, y equals x squared and y squared equals x. So it doesn't really matter what you start with. Um, it's good to recognize what each of these things will look like as a graph. This is a parabola opening upward with its vertex at the origin. This one, interestingly enough, is a parabola opening to the right with its vertex at the origin. So they're very similar. Only one is a parabola that opens upward and the other one is a parabola that opens to the right. The reason it opens to the right is because that y squared is positive. Very similar to why this y equals x squared parabola opens upward. It's because that x squared is positive. So uh, y equals x squared and we know that also, so this is this line, but we also know that y squ x squared, or sorry, we know that x is equal to y squared. So we sub out x for y squared, and that outer square 
corresponds to that square. So we've just subbed in x equals y squared, or y squared for x in this expression to get something completely in y, and then we'll solve for y. We could go the other way and do this for x, but uh, it's just as well one way or the other. So y is equal to y to the fourth, that's from left to the far right side, y to the fourth here. So this is y to the fourth minus y equals zero. We can factor out a y to get y times y cubed minus one equals zero. And the roots to this equation are y equals zero and y equals one. So those are listed right here. So now we have our two intersection points in terms of y. We need to solve for those in terms of x. And we'll use either of these two equations. It's probably easier to use this one since uh, we won't have to solve for an x squared. So x is equal to y squared, which really is little difference on this. Um, y squared, when, when y is zero, zero squared is zero. When y is one, one squared is one. So x is zero, one, or zero, zero, and one, one um, alike. So we have our two intersection points of zero, zero, and one, one. It's fully determined. Now, when we go to draw our two, uh, parabolas that we realized were opening upward and to the right, we can plot our two points here first. And then maybe label, and of course, label this to begin with. Plot our two points at 0, 0, and 1, 1. And then we just draw enough of our curves to pass through each of these points and determine our region. So our regions are always determined by some finite uh, uh, intersected region. Uh, it's just going to be understood to be that, not one of these regions out here that's got an infinite area. Um, it should always have some, uh, it should be a closed region. So um, now we have a choice. We can integrate with respect to x that's moving along the x-axis and considering which function is greater than the other one. And I think that's exactly, uh, that's perfectly reasonable in this case. We're going to go from zero to one in our integral because that's zero and that's one. And that's where our region starts and ends on our x-axis. So our larger curve, it turns out, is the one that opens sideways. That's x equals y squared. So we can rewrite x equals y squared as y equals x to the 1 half, solving for y in that equation. And we've done that off to the right, y equals x to the 1 half. So that is our larger function minus y equals x squared, which is our lesser function, at least along this interval, right? So we're gonna subtract x squared um, as the second part of our difference in our integral. So x to the 1 half minus x squared from zero to one. Um, and then this is a pretty straightforward antiderivative, apply the limits of integration, and it looks like we end up with positive one third. Again, we're pretty happy with that. We didn't get a negative value, so we don't see anything wrong with our answer yet. So that is um, another one integrating with respect to the x-axis. Note that if we wanted to, we could do a very similar situation and integrate with respect to the y-axis from zero to one on y. Our larger function is x equals the square root of y, and it would be the square root of y minus x equals y squared, so it'd be minus y squared. So we'd have y to the one half minus y squared dy, will be extremely similar to this, in fact, completely analogous from zero to one. And we end up with the same exact result. It's just for swapping out the variables. It doesn't always swap so cleanly. Um, it won't always be the same exact integral if we swap them. The reason that that symmetry worked out is because of the symmetry of these two functions that we're dealing with. But I just wanted to, to point out that we can integrate on one axis or the other. And that's the way to go about it. Okay, continuing. Find the area enclosed by the given region. So we've got x equals 2y squared, x equals 4 plus y squared. So we have, uh, we want to look for our intersection points. We'll set the x's equal to each other. So in other words, let's set these right-hand sides equal to each other. And that's exactly what's happening right here. And then we'll solve for y. Uh, bring all the terms over to the left-hand side. We subtract a y squared from both sides. We have y squared on the left. Subtract four, and we got minus four. All that's equal to zero now. So y squared minus four, that factors into y minus two and y plus two. All that's equal to zero. So we get y values of y equals negative two or y equals positive two. 
for our two roots. And then x is equal to, well, we can use either one of our equations to find that. I prefer the easier one, the shorter one. So we can find what our x values that correspond to negative 2 and 2 are. And when we're done with that, we find that one corresponding to negative 2 is 8. The one corresponding to 2 is also 8. So our x, y coordinates are 8 comma negative 2 and 8 comma 2 for our two intersection points. So it's good to know both uh, coordinates x and y for, for, each, for all these intersection points so we can very clearly label these things. Uh, we know that if we go back and look, this is a parabola opening to the right. It's got a positive coefficient in front of y squared. This is also a parabola opening to the right because it's got a positive coefficient in front of y squared. However, this one shifted to the right by four, okay? So that has shifted this one out here to, to have a vertex of four, of four comma zero, whereas the other one has a vertex of zero, zero. So when we look at this, we realize that it's probably easier to consider looking at things from left to right or right to left. Now that's because when we look in this region, the red curve is always larger than the blue curve in terms of X values. So we can use that to our advantage instead of having to deal with uh, whatever this situation is, which is manageable, it doesn't even involve the other curve, um, we can come up with that. But instead of having to deal with that, we can just do one straight integral instead of multiple integrals to, uh, to find the area um, that's to the left of the red curve and to the right of the blue curve. So right and left is greater and lesser um, when we look at, look at things sideways. So having graphed both these and plugged in their, uh, their intersection points or clear, neatly labeled their intersection points, we know that we can integrate from negative two to two along the y-axis and the curve that's further to the right is the larger one and that's minus the curve that's further to the left. So it'll be four plus y squared minus two y squared. And that's exactly what we have set up in the integral down below from negative two to two, as I pointed out. When we finish up the details of that, we arrive at 32 over three. It's a pretty straightforward uh, antiderivative to come up with in that problem. So the setup is the hard part, and that's pretty much true for all of chapter seven. So practicing these and really getting this down will, will, is really the basis for sections to come. So a more general formula for the area between curves is if we're given f of x and g of x, and they might intersect in multiple places. And this is really just a lazy way to write that then, to say that um, the area is the positive area between f of x and g of x. And what we do is we take the difference and just apply the absolute value. Really, there's no, it's not a magic bullet. It doesn't take care of this problem for us just because the absolute value is in there. Remember when we have absolute value in an integral, we have to split up this integral along a and b so that f of x minus g of x is appropriately signed. In other words, if f of x is greater than g of x from a to c, some subinterval, then we just write the integral from a to c of f of x minus g of x. But if they cross each other and g of x is larger than f of x, then we've got to switch it to g of x minus f of x from c to b for the rest of the, uh, the interval. And that might happen multiple times, not just in two subintervals. So let's see an example, it'll be more clear. We're asked to find the area enclosed by the region y equals tangent of x, y equals two sine of x. Um, for x be between negative pi over three and positive pi over three. So first things first, the intersection points, we set y equal to y are the functions equal to each other. Tangent of x equals two sine of x. That's originally this line here. Divide both sides by sine of x because we know that tangent of x is sine of x over cosine of x and we'll cancel it on this side. So we have a two on the right as I pointed out and here's that sine of x over cosine of x for tangent of x. Since we're dividing by sine of x, um, our signs cancel out. So we're just left with one over cosine of x on the left is equal to two. If we solve for this or we invert or find, take reciprocals of this, we'll end up with cosine of x equals one half. In other words, flip both sides of the equation, both fractions. And this is what we have and then solve for cosine of x. Um, it looks like 
cos uh, this is angles pi over pi over three and negative pi over three for cosine of x. So in other words, uh, not to really abuse the graph that we have down below, but uh, pi over three remembers that angle, negative pi over three is that angle. These are positive x values, so cosine is positive. So that's how we determine those two angles for a little uh, flashback to trig and inverse trig. If x is equal to pi over three and negative two pi over three, we can plug it back into either of these functions to determine y. I think it's a little bit easier to plug it into the, the first one I highlighted, this two sine of x. That's what we've done. y equals two sine of x. For pi over three, sine of pi over three is root three over two. Root three over two times two is root three. So root three over two times two gave us that root three. When we plug in negative pi over three, remember that angle's down here. Um, so that leaves us with a negative root three over two times two. So we get negative root three. So our x, y values are that pair and this pair, positive, positive, and negative, negative. Okay, and those are listed. Uh, though there's one more intersection point I should mention um, from the from right out of the gate, we should have seen that tangent of x and sine of x match up at x equals zero. They're both zero when uh, x equals zero. So zero, zero is another intersection point. And all of these coincide down columns. These are our three points along each of these columns. Okay, um, now, you know, if we hadn't caught that, the origin intersection point, then we probably would have seen it when we started to graph it. We know that sine of x, um, well, two sine of x passes through the origin. I didn't, I had flattened it out a little bit so I could see it a little bit better. But uh, this thing passes through zero, zero. We know that tangent of x passes through zero, zero as well. So we'd realize there is one more intersection point. Um, if we need a test value, we can use that. Um, a graph might help us out, but a test value in here could be pi over six or pi over four, negative pi over six or negative pi over four. Same here, negative pi over six, negative pi over four, or sorry, positive pi over six or positive pi over four. And we just wanna see which one, two sine of x or tangent of x is larger than the other one along these intervals. In this case, it looks like tangent of x is larger than two sine of x from negative pi over three to zero. And from zero to pi over three, two sine of x is greater than tangent of x. So, Let's set things up accordingly. That means that when we integrate and we just write down our lazy statement, negative pi over three to pi over three, that's the whole interval of the difference of these two functions. Well, then we have to, you know, at least looked at the graph or done the work with test values to know which one's greater on which interval. And we realize that from negative pi over three to zero, as we pointed out, that tangent of x is greater than uh, two sine of x. So it'll be tangent x minus two sine of x. The opposite is true on the other interval. So we've set it up this way. Now, the good news is, even though we have multiple integrals to deal with, it's just limits of integration that we have to handle. Because when we look here, these integrands are the same. Well, more or less, they're off by a plus or minus sign. So we can handle that as we go. Um, but what we end up with is integrating uh, whichever one we choose first, and then changing the plus or minus signs for the antiderivatives to recycle the work. We've got natural log secant of x for tangent of x, and then positive two cosine of x for negative two sine of x here. And then, like I said, the signs are just different for these, so we can just change the plus or minus signs to recycle the work. Um, if you're not sure about it, you should absolutely complete all the steps to be sure that uh, do both integrals as is so that you are sure not to make any mistakes. We see that there's some symmetry involved here too, while I'm on that point. Uh, be careful with symmetry. A lot of times symmetry is going to deceive us in this chapter, so try to avoid it unless you're absolutely sure. And by symmetry, I mean, well, if we just find the area in this sliver, it's probably equal to the area in this sliver. Unless you can prove that or have a loose way of uh, demonstrating that, I wouldn't really rely on it. And, uh, and you know, just seeing a graph and saying it looks pretty close, is not exactly proof, so, so uh, keep that in mind. Don't get in trouble with symmetry, but definitely use it if you're confident. Okay, finishing these integrals out, uh, these definite integrals, we're just applying the limits of integration. Um, we're doing so carefully. Secant of zero is one over cosine of zero. That's uh, cosine of zero is one, so it's one over one. 
Um, and then that's, uh, let's see, all these details are uh, natural log of one then is zero. So we're seeing that uh, two times one, that two matches up here. Uh, there's a broken line here from here to here. Is, is that evaluation? I'll let the viewer or the reader uh, fill in those details but that should all be just fine. We arrive at something that looks like two minus two natural log of two. And uh, we should say that uh, natural log of two, of course, is a little bit less than one because e to what power is gonna give us two? Well, it's gonna have to be less than one because e is 2.7 something. So that's two times something less than one. So this is less than two. And then two minus that should be positive then. Or a calculator lets you know. So definitely check the details on that and make sure that all of this has worked out the way we'd expect. And if you suspected there was any symmetry, maybe go through and spot that. This would be a good place to see whether or not the symmetry hypothesis actually held. I'll let the viewer uh, dig into that one in their own time. You don't always, you really don't need to rely on symmetry, but it can be a nice shortcut. So yet another example, we've got uh, more trig functions and we're asked to find the area of the region bounded by these curves. And we're told we've got y is two sine x, two cosine x, x equals zero and x equals pi over two. So we have a fully established region just from what's given here. x equals zero is this vertical line. x equals pi over two is this vertical line. Uh, we remember that uh, this is a cosine with amplitude two. So it starts at its, high, at its amplitude on the x-axis. And then by the time it gets to pi over two, cosine of pi over two is zero. So it makes this pass here to here. That's cosine, uh, two cosine of x. Okay, sine, uh, y equals two sine of x. Well, sine starts at the origin if it's not shifted, which it doesn't have plus or minus or anything on it. So that's, that's the case. And by the time it gets to pi over two, it's at its amplitude. Sine of pi over two is one, and one times two here is two. So we go from zero up to two for sine, y equals two sine of x. Now there's one last thing we need to figure out. Where is this intersection point? So I've done this one backwards just to demonstrate that you can. You can start with the graph and then say, okay, I see clearly that these two things are going to intersect. Where is that intersection? How do I find that? So that kind of motivates why we were finding the intersection points to begin with. To find them, we set these two functions equal to each other through their common variable y. That's this, y equals y or two sine x equals two cosine x. Immediately we can cancel the twos. So we have sine x equals cosine x. So divide both sides by cosine x to get sine x over cosine x equals one. And then that's tangent of x equals one, if we want to think about it that way. Uh, where is tangent of x equal to one? A little bit of inverse trig and remembering tells us that it's x equals pi over four. And then what's our y value corresponding to that? Well, we use either one of these functions. I'll just use two sine of x. Uh, y of pi over four is two times sine of pi over four. Sine of pi over four is root two over two. So root two over two times two is just root two. So that is our point of intersection. Now the y coordinate might not be very important because we're probably not going to inter integrate along y. It looks like it's perfectly reasonable to look at this along the x-axis from zero to pi over two. And note that y equals two cosine of x is greater until we get to pi over four. And then y equals two sine of x is greater from pi over four to pi over two. That tells us how to split up our interval. So our lazy version of writing this is down below. We've got our absolute value. Doesn't do us a whole lot of favors, but it gets us started. Let's just write this thing down. And then we do exactly what we said. From zero to pi over four, uh, y equals two cosine of x is the larger one. So we have two cosine x minus two sine of x. In this integrand, I've factored the two out just to clean it up a little bit. It's still two cosine x minus two sine x if you look closely. But on the other hand, sine of x or two sine of x uh, overtakes two cosine of x from pi over four to pi over two. So we express this integral in this way. And similar to the last one, and once again, there might be some symmetry. You could use it if you like, but certainly be careful as you get to know these things, try with symmetry and then check it without symmetry. 
See if you get the same answer. If that's the case, then you were right about it. So um, integrating both of these, cosine of x integrates to sine of x. Negative sine of x integrates to positive cosine of x. I'll let you double check that. And we evaluate from 0 to pi over 4. Um, that's going to be the easy part, just remembering trig evaluations. And similarly, sine of x, antiderivative is negative cosine x. And negative sine x has an antiderivative, I'm oh, sorry, negative cosine of x has an antiderivative of negative sine of x. And then we evaluate that one from pi over 4 to pi over 2. Again, we could see, and I'll point out here, there probably is a bit of symmetry. Look at these two terms compared to these two terms, and then what's happening in between them. Is that doubling? Yeah, it's actually doubling things if we, re, if we move things around. And I don't mean doubling by the twos that are here. I mean uh, that this quantity is exactly equal to this quantity. And you'll find that that is the case, and uh, that's how these things are working out. But overall, we can check that in a calculator that's positive, and at least uh, uh, not see anything wrong with such an answer. So that is, uh, those are several cases for 7.1. It should be enough to get you started and through that this chapter. Take your time with it. Don't uh, get too caught up in symmetry tricks and shortcuts. Setting these things up using the steps outlined in that box and what I've done in these examples is ideal. Um, you really wanna make sure you understand what it is you're looking for, what you're trying to get graphically before you get too deep into the problem. Um, or if you move along into it and you get a few ways in, you might want to go back and check a graph if you hadn't put one together already. So that's it for 7.1. It's a very important part of the rest of chapter seven. So be sure to, to firmly get these skills put in place.